You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. First night on the run, we did 70 kilometers, about 50 miles, and we were carrying our bell kits, which was about 50 pounds. I burnt my feet because we were really hammering it. So the blisters then got infected. Um, I was losing weight rapidly every day. You're lying there just friggin' freezing and no sleep. Um, and then at night, I could start moving and two guys marched me out into a car. They didn't tell me where they were taking me or anything. And uh, they took me out to the middle of the desert and there was a pre-arranged RV with a secret police. And that's when this guy put the, put the gun to my head. I ended up in a hospital in London and because I drank some chemicals and they think um, the chemicals have done something to me because I get this patch and it used to come up on my forehead but it travels around my body and um, the people that did the tests on me they, typical of the army they said we didn't find anything and as I was leaving they said uh, do you have any family? I went yeah I've got a daughter and he said uh, are you thinking about having any other children? and I went yeah he went I wouldn't and then I was like why not? he went we don't know what you've got and my daughter was targeted. She had two policemen on her doorstep for two years. Why? There was a there was a, a team of guys that were going to come along, you know, on video, and probably uh, take her head off. And that was that was that was um, Scotland Yard anti-terror branch that that cracked it, got it in. I was in America, in my house in America, and I got a phone call, and I thought they were going to tell me that there's another, you know, following me. And it wasn't, it said, uh, your daughter's being green lit. Boom, we're on. <laughs> and today's guest, we've got SAS soldier and author, Chris Ryan. How are you doing, Chris? boy, how are you? Not too bad. After that walk from the wrong uh, station. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. First and foremost, thanks for coming on the show. No, no. We'll pr promote your, your new book straight away, but you're an author of 74 books, so I would Great. be here all day if I was to promote all them. But yeah. Chris Ryan, Manhunter, this is a new one. What's this about, Chris? Well, it's basically um, last year uh, when, when I started to write it, um, you know, as you've said, 74 um, books, I wanted to do something that was different. And I just felt you know, I thought back to when I was a kid in the spaghetti movies and the, you know, the concept of that. And I just thought, right, I'm going to write a book, but it's going to have the best battle scene ever at the end where it's right down to the last bullet. And uh, some of my friends up in Newcastle, you know, they're, they're you know, high level organized crime. So, you know, you see, you know, that side of life um, and how they become legitimized and then become property dealers, have businesses and stuff like that. So it all starts off, say, modern day in London and then moves moves into Africa. And as the story pans out, um, the British government has um, interest in a, in a fictitious um, uh, part of the continent and um, basically it's mineral rights. And now this is very close to fact. And at the end, um, there's a massive uh, firefight. And like I say, I won awards um, through the, the writing uh, world uh, for that um, firefight. And it came down to a few firefights that um, actually happened, one being in Tora Bora, where the guys were like fixing bayonets. Um, I've been in quite a few firefights where you, you know, you're down to your last magazine and you think, we're well, gonna be fucked here. And um, just, Something about the regiment that seemed to pull that like rabbit out the hat at the last minute. And there is, you know, there's countless other um, actions that they they carried out. The, probably the most famous one was in Murbat, where there was a bunch of guys at a fort and um, they were fighting off uh, 250 um, rebels. There's only about eight of them. Um, one guy manned a 25-pounder, which usually takes five guys to... Um, to operate he was doing it by himself he got his jaw shot off he wrapped a you know a, a rag around his face carried on firing it the other guys were getting shot and wounded and they overcame um you know 250 50 guys so it it's in that spirit um this this story 
Where can people buy your books, first of all? Um, well, obviously, they can order it from any good independent or Amazon. Um, any bookseller will hold it. But mm -hmm. um, Amazon's the quickest way. But um, I would say support your um, your independence. Every 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 town, village should have one. Um, and then, uh, yeah, online. Good. I've watched many of your videos. Some fucking fascinating stories in there. Like, um, you're the... You break the world record for it was not even a world record, it's just a mad record actually. To you are the longest escape in history. You walked nearly 200 miles, seven yeah. days, eight nights, kind of thing, yeah, through the desert, and you survived. Like, it's a mad story, but we'll touch on all that. But first of all, I always, but firstly, I always like to go back to the start with my guests mm -hmm. where you grew up and how it all began. Well, my I was born in a place called Concert, which um, uh, my parents. They were in, my father was in the um, building trade. Uh, we, we didn't have a pot to piss in. Um, you know, I would say we, we, were, we were in a loving environment, but very poor. You know, no holidays or anything like that. Clothes were always like hand downs. But back in them days, you know, it was before computers, the internet or anything. So, you know, I'd spend my time outside. Um, my father showed me how to catch, say, rabbits, birds and stuff like that to eat um, and stuff. So I spent a lot of time just running around the moors around uh, the northeast. Um, I've got two brothers. Uh, one, he didn't want anything to do with the army. He's got a garage. He does his own thing. Another brother who's still in the parachute regiment, uh, he got commissioned and, you know, he's quite high up in, in the rank side. Uh, all I wanted to do was um, was travel, and I squandered my school life. I I was a, a product of when schools went from grammar from secondary schools to grammar schools into comprehensive, and it was a bad period of time because the grammar school teachers hated the second secondary modern teachers, and they just didn't didn't get on. Well, I I used that discord so I could sit in a class of thirty keep my head down and nobody would ask me a question and I was just happy and I'd be looking out thinking that the best way for me to do anything or to fulfill my dreams was to join the army and in them days we had bases in you know Germany all around the world and I thought I'd get to see places now I left joined the army and uh, the first thing I realized is I'd squandered my education and within the army to get rank you have to you have to go through the educational uh, process so again the difference being in the army you can't just fuck somebody off and if you if you don't work you're not going to get promoted and chances are being in the SES you're going to get kicked out now several things happened i'd been in the in the SES for um two or three years and um i was picked to be sent off to go to Germany to do the German Alpine Guides course, which is a it's a two year course, and you have to you have to be able to speak German, write German, uh, read German. Uh, you're going to wear a German uniform, and everything is in German. So they sent me down to Beckinsfield, uh, which has a um, the British Army Language Lab. I was put into a class with colonels and other high-ranking officers who were getting ready to go out to Germany to take over their regiments, and they'd spent loads of time in Germany, so their German was really, you know, at a high level. I got in there, and I was like, I can't keep up. So I phoned my sergeant major up in Hereford, and I said, yeah, listen, it might be better if you um, send somebody else up to do this course, because um, uh, I'm, I'm finding this language really hard. And he went, if you don't pass, don't come back. And just put the phone down on me. And I was like, fucking hell. So thankfully, the education officer, he'd been an ex-teacher. I said, what, you know, I'm having problems here. He said, yes, because your, your English grammar isn't <laughs> it's, you know, that of a, a three-year-old. So he said, if you want, he said, it's, it's not going to be easy. Um, you can, after six o'clock, after, after work, you can come to the house. My wife and I will run you through English grammar. Um, it'll be up to about 11, 12 o'clock. We'll set you, um, you know, uh, homework. So I was living in the block in Beckensfield, and I think I was running on about two or three hours per day. It was the hardest I've ever worked mentally, but I passed that language course. Then I went on to go over to Germany and pass the, the Alpine Guides course, which again is is the it's the highest level of any mountaineering course because again you're you're a guide um you have to know 
the makeup of weather, the makeup of snow, prediction, everything else. That's before you even strap a set of skis on or, you know, a climbing harness, or it's rescues, working with helicopters in the mountains, uh, everything. So it was a, a very fulfilling course. Um, from, but from a mental side, I knew if I set my mind to something, I could do it. it I'd just been a lazy bastard when I was at school and, and the teachers didn't give a shit. So... This is something we can go on to later on. I've got a passion about my children's books. And whenever I go into a school and I meet a, a kid 14 to 16, I, I basically see myself when he, when he says he's never read a book and he can't read. And I, I, you know, I'm in a privileged position, so I try to focus that and promote reading within you know, the age groups of, say, 12 to 16. Um, and push kids because when they come out now, if they can't read them, got a cat in hell's chance, you know, unless they've got a silver spoon sticking out, you know, the mouth. Um, so all of this, this writing malarkey and my background in the SES changed my life and changed my thought process. You know, it wasn't just about, you know, bringing out bestsellers that have been made into TV, long running TV series. It, it's, it's deeper than that. You can actually help young kids from deprived areas and get them to focus because a lot of young kids when they're in the classroom and if they come from a really shitty area people are looking down at them you know they they know that yet you know you haven't got any money and 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 they're, and they're stigmatized they know there's no books in the house and they can just cast them off and it's like no screw that you know every kid deserves a, a chance yeah definitely so you joined down mate 16 i joined what happened was um I'd, i was going to join as a, a junior soldier and I got jaundice, so my uh, entry into the um, into the military was um, halted for a year. And once I got over that, well, during that period, my cousin he was in the territorial SAS, and he said to me, "Just come up there." And he said, uh, "You know, you can um, you can do selection when you're old enough, um, and and crack on." Now this is before the embassy, anything. Nobody really knew we had an SAS unless you were in the military. So I, I, I joined that and it was a, probably a mistake. I spent too long there. I was there for four years. And then what I had to do is apply to join the parachute regiment. And then from the parachute regiment, joined 2-2 SES. And how long did it take to join the SES? Well, it's a six month process. And I'm lucky because my last two years spent in the regiment, after spending 10, I was a, an instructor running um, SAS selection. So I've seen selection from both sides of the fence. Um, like I say, it's a six month process. It's broken down into segments and it's nothing like that shite that's on TV. I can tell you now. During that six, six months process, you'll never get an instructor scream at you, shout at you, or try to motivate you. Um, the first phase is what they call the Hills phase. This is where we take the soldiers up as individuals onto the Brecon Beacons and um, they're, they're set marches, like walks, they get longer, the, the weight they're carrying gets heavier, but they're always by themselves and there's loads of different routes so they can't follow one another. So after that period, there's test week, which is a set of uh, set marches ending in a 65K march called Long Drag. Um, the successful guys after that have proven that they can push themselves under arduous conditions. The next thing is we then take them to the jungle for five to six weeks. But this time we put them into patrols and we're looking at them as, are they a team player? Can they mix with five other strangers and come to this unit? And this, as an instructor, this is where you start seeing to guys' souls because the jungle is actually harder than the hills phase because it's a hostile environment. As soon as you get under the canopy, it's a, it's a, a, a primary jungle. It's hot, you're either walking up, uphill or downhill. You, you're all soaking, whether it's crossing rivers or just sweating. Um, you're carrying heavy loads, you're under a lot of pressure and everything in there wants to either bury its head into you, bite you or scratch you. Um, so a lot of guys get in there and they become claustrophobic and they can't think about the tasks at hand. They just see this green curtain in front of them. So you could be here, it just looks exactly the same, you walk all day and you get maybe four or five Ks over there, you're knackered and it looks exactly the same. And everything is twice as hard in the jungle. You have to be very careful with your own personal admin. If you don't look at yourself, look after yourself, your body starts falling to pieces. 
So during that period, we've only probably gone into the jungle with 45 guys and we started on the hills with 200. You know, half of these, half of these guys are going to stick their hand up and say, it's not for, not for me. Some of them that don't, you know they're not going to pass. So, you know, you're always making notes. And I used to be fair as an instructor in the, in, under the trees. If I had an, a certain individual and I wasn't sure, what I would do is get him moved into another patrol so somebody else could look at him just to make sure it wasn't a personality, um, you know, problem. Because we all have friends or we all know people, but you don't like them. And there's, you, you know, for no reason. And you just think, hmm, I'll, I'll just check, double check on this kid. The next phase after that is um, combat survival. Again, we get the guys and we teach them all the things they need to know in terms of survival and how to conduct, conduct themselves after capture. That's resistance to interrogation and various things. Next phase after that is um, continuation training. So this is where now we've got to teach soldiers who are used to carrying a weapon in a uniform how to carry a weapon in civvy clothes and then say walk in your neighborhood or my neighborhood and not stand out how to blend in and to be a gray man whilst you know they're on the radio they're following somebody um and that came from say like a northern ireland type of scenario um now they do other scenarios that are, are more fitting like alert working in london maybe following a terrorist cell to know that they've got to get in close to you know put one into their head um other technical equipment now listening devices drones other various other various kit so at, at the end you know it's six months and uh, you're usually left with anything from five to twelve guys and uh, they're then sent off to one of the four squadrons and basically you're, you're the new guy in the squadron but you have to be capable enough to fit in, as in, you know what the score is. Um, a good friend of my brother's, he passed into the regiment and uh, B Squadron was up in Afghanistan, but up, up country. And this lad, uh, he was flown out um, to join the squadron, but he was at Basra. Then he had a, a, a two-day road journey to get to the squadron and he had a bunch of afghan soldiers well on the first day he was ambushed and he was in an ambush for two days conducting like this operation where he's having to call in fast air to to drop audience ordnance bring in other troops to to orchestrate this whole attack so the guys have to be top notch once they pass selection do you know see when you're giving them the course and putting them through their paces do you know from day one who, who's got a good chance of passing? In the jungle, I know within, I would say, a week of how they conduct themselves. And, and there's a couple of little tests I would do with them that I wouldn't, you know, it's not rocket science. There's an exercise. The bit hardest thing in the jungle is navigating to know where you are because you can't see nothing. So everything's done by pacing and it's ridge lines and um, river junctions and things like that. So there's a certain skill to it. So what I would do is take the guys out and we'd do it tactically. So we're moving slowly, you know, everybody getting into fire position, stuff like that, get into a lying up position and they run through all the drills. And then I would say, right, fellas, tomorrow we're going to just do some semi tack stuff um, and I will give you start giving you tips and stuff like that. But I, but I want you up at three o'clock in the morning on the track. Now, when you're in the jungle, and the, and, the, and the light goes down. It's like being locked in a room without any windows and somebody puts a blanket over your head. Now, the guys have to then put the hammock up. They have to put the poncho up. They have to sort the food out and everything else. So that means they're emptying their rucksack and various other things. So get, get them up at three o'clock, pitch black, pack the kit, get them on the track. I would walk them for about 200 meters, then just stop them and say, right, use lots, sit down get yourself a brew on, get something to eat. And then I'd walk down to the basher site. So this used to crack me up. You get to see one basher site, so you find a pair of socks. You get over here, you find some paper, you find something else, you'll find a bit of equipment, you'll find maybe a ma like a, a, a rifle magazine. So then I go back and I'm like, whose is this? You know, the so there's a lot of bollockings. And then it's like, you then get to see how a guy takes a bollocking because... Nobody likes being told, 
you know, that they're an idiot and that their their shit's not together. And it's how they affect them and whether they can get over it. But then you look at their attitude, the way they start looking at you. And then the other thing that I forgot to say as well, what I do is when I get them into that LUP point, I will just say I'm going back to base for an hour and I'll be back. Now, that patrol are supposed to work together. And that means if you're the radio operator, you've got to set up your radio, get your antenna out, and, and then con- like write a message out and stuff like that. So what should be happening is your, your, one of the lads on patrol should be coming to you, asking you to give, give you his hammock and his poncho. So as you're working on the radio, he's putting your bedding up. Another guy should be coming in saying, give us your scoff and we'll eat together. So he's cooking tea as you're sending that message. So the patrol's working. But you can all, I guarantee you'll always get one guy who will slope off and he just gets his hammock up, gets his scoff on, and he thinks he's in bed now for an extra hour's kip because he's just looked after himself. Then as soon as I identify that person, when you watch them as a patrol working, he'll always stand out like a dog, like a dog's bollock. And you know he's not working with it. And the more you watch, the more things you see. And then at the end, you know, you're making notes and stuff like that. And during the period of time, they'll come up to you and they'll just say, you know, I'm going to wrap. The funniest one was we went out on a three day, um, it was actually a three day turnaround Navex. So we walked for three days just directly out into the middle of the jungle. And I could see this kid, he was going to wrap. And uh, sure enough, at the end of the day, he came up and he went, uh, Staff, uh, I've had enough. And I went, Just sit over there and take five minutes. I'll give you five minutes to think about it. And uh, he came back, he went, No, I want to wrap. I went, Okay. Break your weapon, unload your weapon, and uh, break it up. Because this fucker now, he's got a, a live round up the spout, like, you know, and he could get pissed off with me. So just say, break your weapon down, pack it up in your bag. And then he said, oh, well, what happens now? I, went, well, I said, you're, you're off. And he went, well, how am I getting back? And I went, the same way you got here, mate, you're going to walk. And then it, he realized, and it's happened a couple of times, they realized then they'd walked out thinking they're going to rap but never thinking, I'll still have to walk back. So if he kept his mouth shut and just walked back, he would have still been in. You know, so from a mental point of view, you see guys make some really stupid decisions, especially when they're exhausted and tired. And they think a, a spider's around the corner or a snake's around the corner. So the jungle is a great place to be. I love it because w- as soon as I get in the jungle, I know I can step two meters away from you and you wouldn't be able to see me. And I can hide. And and when you consider my escape and evasion was on a flat fucking desert floor, flat as this thing where there was no fucking hiding, the jungle to me is heaven. I don't give a shit. <laughs> I don't give a shit Hiding if I've got trees. I don't give a monkeys if I've got um, ticks on me, bites, leeches, whatever. They can chew away as much as they want. I know I'm safe. Um, whereas in the desert, there's no way to hide. Is that where a lot of people break in the jungle? Yeah. Is yeah. that the main... Yeah. When you consider these guys are the fittest from the course because they've passed the first phase, they get in the jungle and they just wrap. And they let themselves... And it shows mental weakness that they're, you know, they're not focused. And, you know, so, and, and they're all shapes and sizes. You know, you can't just say, mm, he's a big lad like yourself. He's a big unit. He'll be fine. It's all shapes and sizes. Now, another one... And on my selection, which was unusual, uh, during the resistance to interrogation, now you've had a hard week on the run, no food, and living in just your clothes, piss wet through, and sometimes it's all around Scotland and further down uh, to Northumberland. So yeah, you're knackered. And then you go into a, a, a resistance to interrogation for 30, 36 hours. And you get in, you get to, it's, it's very realistic. You are you're subjected to sleep deprivation, which really screws your mind up. But you're interviewed by different people. Um, you'll usually get a guy who looks decent. He'll ask you nice questions and he'll say, if you sign this piece of paper, I'll give you this bar of chocolate. You'll get a right nasty looking guy who's going to threaten you. You know, he's going to knock your head in. You'll get an old guy who will just keep asking you the same question. And he, it's a false he puts you in a false sense of security because you think he's a dithering old guy and then you get a woman. And I'll tell you what, you go into a room as big as this table and behind you and the woman's there, there's two guards behind you 
and there's cameras and what it is is all the other interrogators are watching your reaction and she's listening to them and they do an analysis on you so first thing she does is uh get your overalls off so you're freezing cold so your dick's disappeared <laughs> and she laughs like that she's like that you call that a cock you know is that what's that what, what are you going to do with that well i mean to me i'm just like just blanket zone it out and you're there because you can't talk can't you you can only see your name rank and number that's it and i'm thinking they can punch the shit out of me because they can't kill me because it's an exercise but your head starts to get twisted and these guys are in foreign uniforms and stuff and you're thinking is this real and you start questioning yourself well these lads one lad he was a big old paratrooper being down south he launched himself over the table to knock this bird's head in and obviously the, the guards pulled him down. He was off selection. And he'd done all the work on the hills, done all the work in the jungle. And then another guy did it. And she had seven guys crack under an interrogation. And it's, it is, it's a, it's a, it's a mental state. And it's, it's hard to t tell you. I mean, if you, if you were doing some psychedelic, you know there isn't uh, like say gnomes running around the floor, but they're there. That's like not being on drugs, but it's like being on drugs because you haven't slept for maybe three or four days. And then they, when, you're in the, when you're in the bag, in the pen, you're in stress positions, with being subject to white noise, and it really like screws your head um, in a big way. And that's the easiest way to interrogate anybody is, first of all, keep them up for a week. And then they'll start seeing things, they'll hear voices, and then you throw a bit of waterboard in, and they'll be fucking singing like a, a budgie. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if this is true, but I used to watch the, I don't know what film it was, but they used to, I think they used to put the soldiers under the water, but it used to just tap on the top of their head, like drip. drip. Yeah, it's just and to make you, un they just used to lose their yeah, you, you can, it's making anybody uncomfortable because the white noise, it's, it's a like non-evasive in terms of it's not being hit with a stick because the good thing is somebody's hitting, hitting you with a stick and I'm sure you've had a fair few beatings when they're hitting you, you grit your teeth and say, go on, you bastard, you know, and it, it, it gets your adrenaline up, it gets everything up and you're, you're getting ready to go back when nobody's touching you and you're, your back's breaking, your arms are breaking or you're in a, a sitting position with your hands on your head and then somebody's pouring water over you just to make you cold and you're freezing and that, it, it just, it, it wears you away. So that's the mental torture yeah, of yeah. it, not the physical? Yeah, and it's, it's, you're kept in a room under their control. All I did was... 36 hours you know i know it's 36 hours you don't know how far in you are how far you know you've got to, to go in fact you're that screwed before you go in on the exercise because it's a week on the run and being chased by say infantry units with dog teams so you might have had about three or four beatings during that period um they said you, you when you finish um it'll be the sergeant major of training wing he'll have a white armband on and he'll he'll get you out the room and sure enough, this guy, Don, came and he went, Jordy, uh, that's it. I didn't believe him. I'm like, this is a fucking trick. And I sat outside on the floor and he said, are you all right yet? And I was like, wouldn't speak to him. And it took me about three hours until other guys were coming out of the pen and we're all sat together because you're that aware that this could be a setup. But it wasn't, you know, but that's how much it I screws your head. Yeah. How important is it going through that training and those exercises for if you ever do get captured, is well, it really it, important? It, it is important, but um, the guys that were captured when I was on the run, another element came in, and it was down to the telephone. Now, what you've got to do is, or what we know is, you've got to hold out for a minimum of 12 hours, and um, the information that you have will be rendered useless. So it means you're going to take a beating, you know, for a good period of time. The... The way of soldiering now has is, is, is changed quite a lot because they have tracking devices on them. So everybody knows, oh, they're being captured. You've got like clear comms, you've got this and that. But some of my friends, the Iraqis who were in, in, interrogating them and like beating them, had been to Sandhurst and they had friends who were in the British Army. So one guy's in front of an Iraqi interrogator and he said, so what's your regiment? And he went, parachute regiment. He knew it was SAS, but he just said, no, parachute regiment. And he went, right, okay, who's your uh, company commander? And you remember, you don't know if you're going to get around in the back of your head and stuff like that. So it was, you know, 
it's tense uh, for then the Iraqi to turn around and go, yeah, your, your com uh, company commander, say Josh, Josh Thomas, I was in Sanders with him. I know, him. I know his wife, Julie, and they've got two kids. And it's nearly bringing in that relationship that he knows people that you know, and you think, okay, where's this leaving me? So the dynamics of interrogation have changed. Waterboarding is a very good tool um, because not many people will get through that. So no, it's just, you've got to hold out for, basically when you get caught, you've just got to remember, I'll hold out for as long as I can. And you know that back at base, they're wiping the slate clean of anything that you were doing, or any codes you may have, any locations, um, because they're going to get, they're going to get yeah. that information. The Geordies are the tough bastards. The Geordies, kind of the Geordies, the Liverpudlins, the fucking and the Glaswegians are quite. I know a lot of the Scottish pass the mm -hmm. SES course. Why is that? Also? Well, I think my my best friend. I was out with him the other day. Um, he came from a tenement in in Edinburgh, and all he single parent just wanted to get out, get out because it was in a really rough end of Edinburgh. He wanted to get out. My mates. Uh, one of the lads, I mean, he was verging on like a psycho. He, his dad ran a, um, a, an abattoir in Glasgow and he wanted to, you know, just get away from the place. Um, a lot of lads didn't have a, a pot to piss in. You know, they come from very similar backgrounds. And this is why the army has a problem. When lads were leaving the army over the last 20 years because of the stresses that they were under, you know, because we were embedded in Iraq and Afghanistan and it went on for a hell of a lot, long time. A lot of them don't have any families. And, you know, they either, some of them were orphans, some of them single parents, they can't go back or whatever. And they end up on the, on the streets homeless because they don't have that network. Plus the fact some of them were going home and they, their mates didn't understand, you know, what they'd, what they'd been through or what they'd seen. I mean, there's a lot of bluffing as well going on uh, and bullshit. But um, on the whole, yeah, the guys come from checkered backgrounds. I mean, I can remember, and this is, I swear to God, this is true. It was a guy, I'll not say the village up in, in Scotland, but he came from Scotland, sat around, and somebody started on about why, you know, we joined. And I said to travel, one me mate, he said he wanted to get out of the tenement because it was shite. Somebody else said... In, um, there was no prospects and one of the lads said my dad used to shag me and the conversation stopped and I was waiting for like the punchline is a, like, yeah. like a joke and he went his next thing was he went and my mother knew and she didn't stop him so he said I left at 16 to join the marines and that was like that's the end of that conversation but we all probably know people who's been abused, or whether it's just physically or, you know, like the other side. And and they want to get into an organization that's got a family and then all their mates are there. But some of these young kids, you know, that were subject to that sort of thing, they joined the army at a time where you were going to be in Iraq or Afghanistan. You're going to see your mates getting slotted and all the rest of it. And not all of them could, you know, endure that that type of pressure and then they're caught between you know the devil and the deep blue sea do they go back to that you know shite that drove them away there or or what do they do and and another thing with soldiers you're very you're very much protected being in that organization your wage is paid in the bank somebody gives you a uniform wednesday's like fizz day the doctor's there the dentist is there whenever you want you've got a bunk you've got a room you get help you get fed everything's done for you all of a sudden when you're pushed out into civvy street it's not so easy as being in the military and you, you've got to fight you know and it's it's really hard to do anything and then they've left an organization excuse me they've left an organization where they think they're at the top of the game and all of a sudden they get out <clears throat> and they haven't got a they haven't got a job and they're not at the top of the game. And it's it's, it's difficult. It's challenging yeah, for them. Because there's no structure involved. <coughs> yes. The people slip back into old habits. But do you tend to see that a lot of people who pass the toughest courses are the ones who come from trauma and get nothing to lose? Yeah. A lot of them. Um, I would say all my mates came from um, very similar backgrounds. Um, in fact, it was just the officers who had privileged backgrounds. All the guys just came, usually council houses, um, 
and you know certainly not wealthy or anything like that and and that shows um it, it shows a lot with the guys but them guys when you when you work in a team there's something and you'll you'll understand this it's being streetwise street savvy you can walk into a bar and if a fucking guy's looking at you you know it's either going to kick off and you'll probably have a number of things you're going to do is what's around uh, there's either a bottle there there's a chair there or there's an escape route there like say an officer that's been to a privileged background he'll wander in there and he'll not recognize that this guy's clocked him for whatever reason or something's not right or that person shouldn't be in here for whatever reason it's like being on a street you walk down a street and you're making assumptions without you even knowing you're making assumptions you know, uh, when sadly, when them attacks happened on London Bridge, people have got their heads down. They're walking on the wrong side of the road, first of all, because the car's coming from behind them. They're, they're on, they've got their ear pugs in, they're reading emails, and then they get, they get flattened. Or when the attacks were going on and people were stabbing and people's running towards them, not knowing who the attackers are. I think when you've come from a, a certain type of background, you read the streets and you, you can read where it could all go wrong. And we used to do that, you know, cross the water, you can walk around and you just look at somebody the way he's dressed. And I can't, I can't ex say exactly what it is, but you just know something's wrong. I look at people and if they're looking at you, and it could just be somebody like looks and then looks away. But if you, if he's still looking at you, I immediately look, look at his hands and then how he, how he's dressed and, and you know, what, what interest has he got with me? Now I went through a period of time where I was doing lots of TV work, but I never felt, you know, I, I was known. So I was in a bar with my brother in Newcastle and two guys. Uh, oh, looking at you. Yeah. And I felt eternally shamed. <laughs> my mother was in hospital. She was going down with cancer. So it wasn't the best. It wasn't the best times for me. That's the only thing. And uh, these two guys, and I said to my brother, uh, Keith, I went, it's going to kick off in a minute, mate. And he's a handy fuck. And he went, Ooh. I said, there's two across there. Um, and um, it's going to fucking go. And I said, here, here we go. And they started walking over. So I just went straight over. I went, what the fuck are you looking at like that? And, and my brother was there. Fucking hell. <laughs> These two guys, they were, they were lovely. And they said, oh, we thought you were that guy, Chris Ryan off TV. Uh, we've been watching. We've been, we've just been thinking, uh, would it be all right to come over and talk to you? It's like, Fuck's sake. I said, yeah, listen, I'm sorry. And I'm like, my mother's in a hospital. Then I'm talking to these guys about my mother in a hospital right. and I didn't want to. So there's that, there's that sort of thing. But usually walking around, you get that, you get that skill set. And all my mates, I know they've all got it. See, when you pass the SAS course, did you see a, a change in you straight away? Or do you not notice those changes yourself? Um, no, I mean, cause I was big into my fizz then, um, you think, you know, the world's at your feet, um, and probably do a few stupid things. It, it probably wasn't until I had my daughter, um, I was, you know, I was, I wasn't as carefree, um, in terms of looking after myself, whether diving out of a helicopter, you know, free falling or fast roping, um, you would, you would look at life slightly different, but, um, I knew, um, I wouldn't be one of these old guys hanging on in there, swinging the lamp and hanging on to dear life. You've definitely got a shelf life to do that job. And it's, it's around 35 to 40 and you should be like, you should be leaving. Yeah. yeah. What was your first mission once you became a SAS soldier? Um, well, we would do cover um, when um, there was an operation in Northern Ireland. We would, when we were on the anti-terrorist team, we'd head over and to do that. Um, we were mobilized to uh, go there, uh, mobilized to go to uh, Aden. Then the, the Gulf kicked off um, to go out there. And then after the Gulf, they sent me out to Zaire to evacuate the British Embassy. And I think that's when I probably had some, like, say, mental problems. What were Um Well, obviously, that thing in Iraq, it had taken its toll, but there was no no, no such thing as PTSD or, you know, anything like that. And I just thought, you know, I, um, I didn't really see, see a problem because when you've got mental illness, you're looking through the same set of eyes, but it's your friends who say something's 
something's changed with you. And usually it's it's down to violence, wanting to scrap, just being a moody bastard, um, not having, not tolerating fools, and also being driven. So pushing yourself to stupid limits. So, you know, you, if, it, if if we were doing anything physical, I'd I'd want to, you know, be the the guy at the top. If it was something mental, then I had to do that. And it manifests itself in in different ways. Some guys used to get divorced straight away. Um, some guys would be, you know, take to the bottle, drinking. Um, and then others would just, you know, sit on it. There was a lot of suicides. Went through a patch of quite a few suicides, guy killing killing themselves. Um, and then other guys get become uh, like junkies. And my mate from Edinburgh, he started, after he left the regiment, he started a, a, his own private um, military contracting company, made, made millions, you know, lots of money. But again, he was always on the ground. He'd phone us up. And I, it doesn't matter where I was in the world, he's like, he's laughing at the other end of the phone. They're in, say, his last phone call was, he was in a police station and he said, oh, we're brassing these uh, these guys up. And you could hear the machine guns firing, the um, firing fire orders coming out. You know, and I'm like that, John. You're going to be the, you know, the richest man in the graveyard. You need to fucking get out of there. But he was, he was addicted to it. The adrenaline. Mm -hmm. That's this, the mad thing, though, that you're training these people to be the toughest people on the planet, the fittest, the strongest. But yet, the brain's a powerful thing. That if it sees trauma, it doesn't matter how hard you train. Like yeah. it, once it goes, it goes. And you've seen that with, like I say, these guys who are the elite of the elite who are willing to go anywhere in the world to die for a cause to try and save lives but as soon as they see trauma because it's not a humane thing to see pain no and trauma, you get well you get um you get over it um and you become you get desensit over it though or do you forget it forget it you put it in a box yeah you desensitize from it mm -hmm. and i suppose i was really desensitized to the point where if a guy my age when i was say maybe 30 32 said oh um, I'm um, feeling a bit shit. My mother died, or my dad died, you know. And I'm like, fucking hell! Well, they're gonna die anyway. <laughs> and that's not. That's, yeah. But yeah, it's yeah, 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 and yeah, that's yeah. Be, you know that's <laughs> after seeing people dead. I mean, I was yeah. in Zaire watching kids starve to death. Didn't give it monkeys, you know. It's that's it. So you get that desensitization, which isn't nice, and it's 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 not good. Um, so you have that, and like. I went to 18 funerals in my 10 years in the SES. 18 guys and uh, hot, like th three of them I, I was on selection with, passed into the regiment with. Another bunch, a bunch of them used to drink with them all the time. You'd feel sad for the, the day when you found out that they died. You're like, oh, you know, down out, you have your funeral and then it's back to work and that's it. But what happened with me the first guy I passed into the regiment was a lad called Fergus Rennie. And he was a very professional soldier. He was the first SAS soldier to be killed in Bosnia. And um, I was sat in the house and uh, the guard, when it came through the guard room, one of the lads phoned us up and said, just to let you know, Fergus is, um, has been killed. And that had a different effect. It was nearly like losing a child, not that I have, but the only way I can explain it, and it had a profound effect on me because I knew that kid inside out from being his instructor throughout selection. And a couple of other things, I could have sacked him. He did a couple of things that if I'd been harsh, I could have sacked him and he wouldn't have been in the SES. And I was wrapped with guilt for many years thinking that kid would still be alive. He wouldn't have been a happy one for not passing selection. But yeah, he had a different different effect on me and he was part of the reason I left the regiment um, and then subsequently over the years five other guys died uh, that I took through selection but I mean that's where you've got to grip yourself and think well wait a minute they were chasing their dreams you were just a conduit that you know facilitated them into the regiment you know their lives aren't on you know my responsibility when you know them that well and you've seen them on their knees you know fucking breaking and then you realize that they're just you know they're, they're, they're being killed it's it's not a good feeling yeah how does that affect relationships and stuff then becoming cold or 
do you still have some emotion towards trying to build a relationship with people or do you just become so cold that you don't think? Sometimes it's like, I, my mates, you know, um, when we get together, we're, we're fine. Um, other, like outside friendships, if it's like, you know, with a, you know, like they say a female or whatever, it's it takes a long time before you start trusting them or trusting somebody. And I, But the other thing as well, with with the likes of, me and it's the same as um some of the guys i know if somebody tries to screw you like as in you know rip you off or do anything first thing is i'm gonna fucking do them and you can't go through life like that um so you've got to tail back a bit i mean i was terrible for like say road rage for a while now i'm like who gives a shit type of thing um but it's 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 sometimes your reaction can cannot fit the 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 your your reaction cannot fit the action that's just say happened, and you, you know sometimes I could be too quick to to bark. I could probably be too uniform. My daughter, I mean, she's got a master's in English literature. She's got m more m more letters behind her name than than anything, um, and then she decided she wanted to be an artist. I'm like, well, what's that about? Like, you know. Um, and we used to log heads because I was like, no, this is what you're going to do. You're leaving school, you're going to university, you're doing this, you're getting that job. And she's like, yeah, screw you. This is what I'm doing. And really, you know, it was her choice. And I shouldn't have, I could have saved a lot of heartache if I just went, yeah, that's up to you. Do whatever you want. Is that the old sergeant kind of kicking in? Yeah, I think then? it is. You know, only because it's all right, I, I guess. It's, it's easy enough for her, but when you've been brought up, you know, with nothing, and you've seen people with nothing, you don't want to go back to like that. Mm -hmm. But then it's, it is tough because as everybody's got their own choices, but you're just used to seeing kids maybe not ruining their life, but you've seen kids lose their life as well. Mm -hmm. So you're just wanting to try to bring the best out for her, but even though you're probably pushing her away because you're it being totally, too strict. Yeah, too strict. And my mate, John, um, he's done exactly the same to his son. And he, we were just talking about it on Sunday night. And, um, the, the, you know, it's nearly like the bank of mum and dad. And he's like, that. no, you've got your job. You've, you've been, because his son went, he sent his son to Fetty's up there. And then, you know, all the best schools. Um, but then John expects him to be like him, which he never will be like him. You know, my daughter will never be like me because it was the upbringing. And maybe if I'd, like, said, yeah, right, you're going to live in this rough area to teach you a lesson. You should be like, say, a bit like me, but she's not. So you can't, it's very difficult, the parenting. First of all, there ain't a novel, uh, sorry, or a, 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 like a, a guideline um, to, to read. Um, but also you, you're, you're usually giving the best you can to your children, which is quite the opposite than, say, what we were probably getting as children. So you, you create a different model. Can your daughter understand all what you've been through and what you've seen as well? You know what she would say? I don't give a shit, really. <laughs> <laughs> Do you actually see a lot of yourself and your daughter yeah. then? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll tell you what. Yeah, because uh, I've got to watch her. Because when, when we start having an argument, I know there's a nut coming in somewhere along the line because yeah. she'll, uh, she'll get physical or she'll, yeah. uh, she'll get a bit feisty. But uh, no, it's, yeah, it's, it's just life. I mean, you bring your family up the best you can and, um, you know, you just hope for the best. Yeah. See, so when you get the longest... Uh, what was that longest escape, escape innovation? Yeah, escape, 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 escape in innovation. History, like two hundred miles. Like it was eight kids. It was, was it Iraq? You went? Yes, yeah, so it was in Iraq. Um, we went in to Iraq um, to look for Scud missiles, but we broke every standing operating procedure going. Now the SAS have what they call SOPs, and it's uh, it's how we pr like um, it's how we conduct operations. Well, we, our maps dated back to 1945. We didn't have the right clothing. We didn't have the right radios. Um, we didn't have the right intel. And um, we were going in to basically dig in underground um, to an area that overlooked a, a main supply route. And um, when we got there, we found that the main supply route wasn't like a tarmac road. It was just a series of tracks. Well, the, the missile, the Scud, can't drive down them tracks it needs to be on like a proper road so we knew we we're in the wrong place and the weather the weather was a big factor 
It was the worst winter Iraq was having for 30 years. And uh, it was within a short period of time we were compromised. And um, we tried to um, establish communications back to base. Couldn't get through. I eventually got through by tapping out Morse code to some guy in Cyprus who then relayed a message back. But by that time, it was too late. We ended up in a contact and then Iraqis tracking us down. Over the period of, say, two or three days, um, well, the first day, I was split up from the group with two of the lads. Um, sadly, um, in, in, in the early hours of the next, well, next day it started snowing and uh, Vince died of hypothermia right next to us and we had the same clothes. So I watched, I watched a man die uh, freezing to death. Then the other lad, he went off with a goat herder and then I was ended up by myself and um, basically yeah, seven days, eight nights uh, to hit the Syrian border. Um, and the cold was the, the hardest thing. During the day, I couldn't move. Um, I would try and find a hollow, somewhere to hide, desert floor, there's nothing there. And this just this wind cutting through, um, had cold injuries and all the rest. And then the first night on the run, we did 70 kilometers, about 50 miles, and we were carrying our bell kits, which was about 50 pounds. I burned my feet because we were really hammering it. So the blisters then got infected. Um, I was losing weight rapidly every day. You're lying there just friggin' freezing and no sleep. Um, and then at night, I could start moving. And, um, you know, you keep bumping into Iraqis and, and various others. Then eventually got to the border. And um, when I got across the border, I got to a Syrian, like, well, like Bedouin, uh, they got me into a town, but then there was a lynch mob trying to, like, get me back into Iraq. Uh, then the police held a mock execution for me um, where they <clears throat> blindfolded me, put a pistol to my head. And I eventually got back to Damascus um, where I was handed over to the secret police. And during a, that, that first handover, I was allowed to use, like, a bathroom to clean myself up because obviously I hadn't washed or anything and shave, um, but I'd lost 36 pound in body weight in seven days, or lost all my toenails, uh, all the blisters had turned uh, septic, there was pus coming out of them, I had what you know was bed sores on the sides of my leg, my back, arms, elbow, and then if I squeezed my fingernails, there was pus coming out of them, um, if I sucked in my mouth blood, I had a blood disorder, damaged liver, damaged kidneys, um, I drank some water that had come from a, a chemical plant and that was full of effluent that had burnt my mouth. Um, and then it took three days to get out of, out of Damascus, got into Riyadh, and then a flight back to the base in Saudi where my squadron was. And then it transpired, four of the guys had been captured, two had died of, of uh, hypothermia, froze to death, legs had tried to swim the Euphrates, and he died immediately on the other side, um, and one guy was shot and killed. So um, two guys died of, of, of cold, which is criminal, uh, because we didn't have the right kit, right, um, right radios. And, um, and also, we've been told that if we were contacted, they would send in a helicopter to pick us up. But when we did get contacted, uh, they changed their mind. And um, and said no, let them let them write them off. Suicide mission. Yeah, that was it. That you're gone. I mean, it's it's no big deal because that's what you've got the SAS for. And what the other thing, to be fair, when they sent that, if they sent a helicopter in to get us, they would have probably had to send two or three, and we only had uh, two to the regiment. And if the risks were, if we'd been caught by the Iraqis, it could have been a come on. So when the helicopters came in, they'd have been blown out the sky or you're risking having maybe 60 guys in that helicopter to come and rescue eight. And if it went down, got hit, you've lost all of them guys. And remember, you know, the SES are trained in escape and evasion. Um, but I mean, yeah, that was it. So yeah, it was 200 miles um, to the Syrian border. 
Uh, it was the longest seven days of my life. <laughs> Does that not make you angry though? To is that just part on part just of the part job? You got to accept that? it. I mean, I didn't have any food and very little water. In fact, at the end, I was hallucinating because of the, the lack of water. My brain had sh like shrunk. Um, but you've just got to accept it. It was just one of them things from the point when we were compromised, everything was going to go downhill. Because I again, I can remember when I was getting on the helicopter to fly in, um, one of the lads was standing there and he was like, this is not right. I went, I know. I said, it's a one-way ticket, but we're still fucking going. And um, and that was it. You know, you, I guess the regiment when I say they use the word gamblers, they'll take risks, you know, to pull something off. But you know, if it goes wrong, it's going to go catastrophically wrong and it'll just, the, the dominoes will fall. Um, because again, you know, you're out there by yourself. And So seeing you, you're going through that for the seven days, what's going through your mind then? Did you, at any point, did you think, am, am I going or did, well, every, you, did you keep believing to yourself? No, I'm not no, going every, to die? every day, there's one, it sounds, it's going to sound really pathetic, but there was... The first day I was by myself, um, I made the Euphrates and I had to crawl into the Euphrates to get to a depth to fill my water bottle because I didn't have any water. And uh, I, I left, it was still dark, and I started to push back into the, the what they call the wadi systems, these dried riverbeds. And I found one and it was on a north-facing slope. So I got into a hollow and lay there. I was fucking freezing like because I was wet again and the temperatures are below, below zero. And I'm like, fuck. And I knew I was by myself now. And I knew I probably had five or six days of walking. And uh, I, I don't know what it was, but this thing popped up in my head. And uh, it was me mother talking to us, going, as a kid, she used to say, if things get on top of you, just have a good cry. Just uh, just cry and you'll, you'll get over it. So I'm sat there and I can look around, like, uh, make sure nobody's looking. And then I went... <laughs> I couldn't cry, but what it did is I started laughing and I laughed. I was just like laughing and it, it actually cleared my mind. And I was like, right, yeah, you are by yourself. You've got five days walking. You've got no food. You've got water. Everything's okay at the minute. And it was just boom. And then I could plan. But having said all of that, every night after that, there'd be times where I was walking and I was that knackered, I would get like, you know, I'd end up on my knees feeling sorry for myself. And then you start shivering and then you're like, come on, you to get moving. And there was, there was, it got to the point where my feet were that bad with it when, when they were infected, that the pain was too much to, I would sit down and then the, it, the pain would like move from my feet and I'd be like that. <sighs> But when it came to move, which was which was in probably a couple of minutes because it was freezing cold, and I happened to stand on them, I had to shuffle, like just shuffle a couple of steps. And it must have looked fucking pathetic, really, until my feet were numb again, and then I could start walking. And then it got to the point where I would rest on my rifle and I would keep the pressure on my feet and then carry on moving. And then at the seven-day point, it was more through the lack of water um, I started collapsing, but I was hallucinating. And um, one day, one night, my daughter came in front of us and I was trying to grab a hold of her hand and like, I could see her feet moving, rocks moving, and I was just following it. I don't know what I passed on the left or right of me. And then what would happen is, the first time it happened, it was like a static when, when you hear like electricity going <laughs> like that. And then I got punched in the back of the head. It was this big bang. And it was that realistic. When I went, I went down on my knees, I turned around to see who'd punched me. And obviously there was nobody there. So I got myself up. It happened again. And when I came to, I'd, I was flat out on the desert floor shaking. I'm like, that. that's a stupid place to, to fall asleep. Then it did it again. Um, I was I was across the border. It did happen again, and I'd fallen against a small like wall, broke my nose, and then at first light I could see a house, and that was the Syrians that gave me the water and tea. But I was fucked. Now, a human body, a human usually can go ten days without food, but water you'll get three days maximum, maximum before you go. And what what them bangs were? That was my my brain 
shorting out. It was my brain was shrinking and the messages that go around your brain were just fucking colliding. And it was like, you just your body's closing down, but it's your brain that's closing your body down. And uh, I knew I was knackered. And when I came to, I could see the small house with smoke coming coming from it. And I thought, you know what? If it's, if it's a rack, I'm taking water and I'll kill them. I don't give a shit now. If it's Syria, then they should help me. And I got there. There was a, a young lass um, with like a look upturned walk making a bread on a fire. An old boy was leaving the, the like mud hut with some goats. And then this young lad came out and uh, I just said, water, water. And then I was saying, Iraq, Iraq. And he didn't. I said, Syria, Syria. And he went, ah, Syria, Syria. And then he was like, Yaki, Yaki. And then I could see the border. So I knew I was in Syria. And then he went straight in, gave us this bowl of water, drank it. And then in in the room, um, he gave us a, a small glass of sweet tea. And it was like being on chemicals. It was just like, boom. And that was just a bit of sugar. And it was like, woof. And I said, right, I need to get to a police station. Um, I packed my rifle up, my bell kit up, he gave us a bag. I wanted to see what my feet were in, what state they were in, pulled them off. He he then quest, he, he pulled, he requested his sister, I think. She then disappeared with my socks. And I mean, they were minging, there was puss and everything in them. So like washed the, the clean my sh- like feet off. She brought the socks back, put them on. And then I drew her like a diagram on a, a piece of paper, like newspaper with a, a crayon and said, I need a policeman. So as we were walking into town, there was <clears throat> this Syrian coming out and he'd been buying um, stuff for his camels here and he could speak a bit of English. And uh, he said, what do you want? And I was like, I need to get to a police station. And to him, I was saying, I'm a pilot. Uh, I crashed my aircraft and went in through a series of things that happened. He got to a garage and uh, pulled into the garage and he'd been saying to me, I should take you back to Iraq because my cousins are from Iraq. And I'm like, no, nah, I ain't going back to Iraq. I need to see the police. He kept touching the uh, bag to see if I had a weapon in there. Well, there was two, two guys filling diesel up at a pump like that. They came straight up the window, didn't look at me, looked down at the bag and then ran off to the back of the, the garage. So I was like, it's kicking off. So I grabbed my bag and as I was like getting out of the vehicle, he grabbed my arm. So I dragged the fu- fucker over the chairs and like started slamming his head on the door. Then I was running down the street and I would have said I was, I was sprinting and I turned around and there was about two 70 year old guys just like this behind me. But them young lads had come out and they had like, you know, the sticks and stuff. And I just, just kept on running and came around this corner and there was a guy with an AK-47 and he just had, wait, it was a police station. He grabbed me. Otherwise, they would have had me, and they would have been. I would have been over the thing. He grabbed me, took me into a courtyard, and then held the crowd outside. And then over a few a few hours um, of like sending a couple of code words, hoping that they would get to the coalition, they give me this dish dash to put on and a shamag over my face. And two guys marched me out into a car. They didn't tell me where they were taking me or anything, and uh, they took me out to the middle of the desert and there was a pre-arranged RV with a secret police and that's when this guy put the put the gun to my head and then the next minute I was in Damascus handed over I mean the gun thing they were just pulling the piss they were just having a laugh uh, but I'd lost my sense of humor at that point um, <laughs> you know, so but anyway I got into Syria fuck me they couldn't have done enough for me they sent me out they sent a young lad out took my measurements like got me a, a suit, shirt, socks, underpants and shoes, but my feet were in ba- that bad a state. I couldn't get the shoes on. And then they got me round to the British embassy where I was there for two days and I had to wait to get a passport made. And then, then the Syrians wouldn't let me leave the country because I didn't have the incoming visa. So I had to go back to the secret police and they got the visa stamped and then I got back to the regiment. Um, but I was I was in a bad way for... For a good six weeks, um, it took about probably six weeks for all the scarring to heal up, my feet to heal up. Um, And like I I was just like an old man walking. Um, My fingernails came back. Um, My gums had receded, so I was getting terrible toothache. My gums had shrunk both up and below. Um, And like I say, 
the weight, it took about three months for the weight to get back on, but your body's got that muscle memory, so it came on. But then the, the, I ended up in a hospital in London and because I drank some chemicals and they think um, the chemicals have done something to me because I get this patch and it used to come up on my forehead, but it travels around my body. And um, the people that did the tests on me, they, typical of the army, they said, we didn't find anything. And as I was leaving, they said, uh, do you have any family? I went, yeah, I've got a daughter. And he said, uh, are you thinking about having any other children? And I went, yeah. He went, I wouldn't. And then I was like, why not? He went, we don't know what you've got. But they, that's that chemical plant was where Saddam Hussein was trying to make yellow cake. And um, it was bombed by the Americans. And then Delta, guys from Delta Force, whom I know, they flew in right into this compound where I had been because... When I got out, I had to I had to brief them of of the layout of this place, and then one of their lads got uh, compromised, and he was shot and killed, killed in action. He got a t took a direct round in his head, right right where I where I'd been sitting. But yeah, you don't glow up in the dark or anything, do you? <laughs> okay, now I'll tell you what. Um, the the luminosity on my watches is always all right. <laughs> See, when, so why do you think you survived that? What does that come down to? Just mental toughness. I read something that. There was a man who got locked himself in the freezer mm -hmm. and he, he said, I'm going to die. He kept repeating himself that he was going to die. He wrote Axel down that he was going to die. There was, it was cold air, but it wasn't. The, 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 the freezer was actually broke. Yeah. And then when they came in and got his body, he was he did freeze to death, death. but the, the, the freezer it's, wasn't even working. Yeah. He killed himself by yeah. putting that in existence. You know, it's, I've got to be careful on here because this is real and as in guys did die, but it's definitely mental, mental strength. Yeah. And um, I would say, first of all, I'd been through SAS selection. I'd been trained on escape and evasion for like SOPs in terms of the procedures, how I, you know, like always a north facing slope. So the sun's not on you. It's always in shadow to hide and um, things like that. Um, keep away from the population. You don't, you don't go and try and hire a vehicle or get a vehicle or try anything funny. Because uh, obviously I didn't have any food. You don't try and break into houses like that because it's you're signaling yourself you're flagging yourself and again I, I think it's that northern northern thought process you get down but you're like well fuck it i'm going to get back up and i'm going to push what's the you know my choices were um i either hand myself over to them or i die so it's like i thought i ain't handing them over to like get killed and and just push yourself on and you do wasn't like a big streak of glory because there was them times where I sat down and thought I can't do go on. You get over it and you just keep pushing on. Uh, see the three kids that get that get captured. Why did they kill one? Um, they well, what happened was um, they were in a firefight and uh, there was uh, four of them. There was five of them. Sorry, five. And um, a lad called Bog Consiglio. He was in my troop. He's the bravest man that I know of, and this guy should have had a VC. When they got contacted and the Iraqis were coming at them, Bob went down because he had the Minami machine gun. And when you fire a Minami, you do it uniformly. It's like bursts of not like like that. It's aimed shots, so he's getting three bursts out. Now, when they split up, the group split up, Bob went down. These two guys thought Bob was with these two. These two thought Bob was with them. So these, these four were captured. And when they came out, they thought, they basically said exactly what had gone on. So the conclusion was Bob got down on his gun to give these guys enough time to escape. And it was 40 minutes. He, he kept firing his weapon for 40 minutes. And then his weapon ceased firing. And he was, his body was returned back to the UK. He'd been shot through the head, but the angle of the round entering and and exiting meant he was behind the gun firing when the round went through and also a round had hit his hip which had detonated a phosphorus grenade and that's how he was killed uh, one of them lads was um shot in in the ankle um and the other two managed to escape and swim the euphrates but then one of them died swimming the euphrates um 
So no, I mean Bob, he uh, he gave his life um, to save them four guys, um, and that that's how he was killed. Mm. How far would they have had to have swum to make sure? Uh, well, the Euphrates shore? is like um, it's a, like a big city river, you know. It's probably about because I looked at it, I, I looked at getting across, and I was like, not a chance, you know. When you see it, um, you you t- like a hundred meters type of thing, and it was the middle of winter, and I was like. Not a chance. I didn't think they had winter in Iraq and stuff. It was snowed. Um, on on the day I was laid up with Vince and uh, Stan, I was lying there waiting for the light to come up, and um, I, fit, I was like lying in a ditch in a in a where it was at what they call a tank berm. It has earth on three sides, and uh, the tracks had um, subsided, and uh, we're lying there, and I got pins and needles in my face. I woke up, I'm covered in snow. And I'm like, ah, oh, and we didn't have any kit. And we lay there. The next thing we saw, because the light came up, there was an Iraqi position right next to us and uh, we couldn't move. So we had to lie there. That ditch filled with water. It rained, snowed, rained, snowed. It was like being... Tortured? Well, it's like being on, say, the Scottish mountains. You mm. know when you get that snow mixed with rain? Sleep. Yeah, and it's it's going to soak you and you're lying in mud and the wind is sucking the life out of you. It was the longest day of my life. And I mean, as I said at the beginning, I'm an alpine guide. I've been in Siberia. I've been in some of the coldest places on earth. That was the coldest day I've ever spent because you've got the, the killer elements of being wet, the wind, and then more rain and snow yeah. coming down. So what happens when you get home then? Do you get discharged or do you get treatment and straight back in for another mission? Oh, no, well, they wouldn't let me go home. When I got out and got back to uh, Saudi, they went, all right, uh, nobody knows that the guys are missing because nobody knew what had happened to them. Said, you've got to stay here for uh, another two months. And the boss said, uh, we'll get you back over the border. You know, you can get back on ops. I'm like, I can't even walk 100 metres. Like, you know, I'm out of breath. Um, so I just hung around. I got back to Hereford uh, about two months after the event. Um, then I ended up being on the standby squadron. And then there was a big problem in Zaire where a team of guys had to go in and it, it was going to get sporty. Um, so I was the first person they picked because I'm a communicator in terms of like sat, sats in the, in the other type of radios. I'm also a trained medic, patrol medic. Um, and, um, so, and then I was the right rank to take on that job. So when they picked me, I'm like, ah, fuck off. And I had to put an indent in for kits. So I'm like, yeah, jimpy machine guns, grenades, 66 rockets, claymore mines, this foreign office came back and said, no, you can take an MP5 and a pistol. And then this is probably unbeknown to me. This is where the PTSD started coming out because I thought this is another fucking operation that's going to go wrong and you're going to be under-equipped. Then they upped the team to four, so it's going to be four men, and then they upped it to eight men, but still MP5s and maybe um, a couple of um, M16s or two or threes. And I got across there and then the job kept going on and on and on. And we saw some awful things of like kids starving, a lot of murders, like infighting within their, their community because the country was being run by President Mobutu. And he was, he the country was in shit state and the economy was through the floor. So he was allowing um, the, the his army officers to loot houses and then the soldiers could go in to pick, have the pickings and then the civilian people could go in and pick over that. So then you could imagine how much fighting was going on. There was a bit of like machete wielding and uh I, you know i saw quite a few young young black lads with uh, the old machete um uh marks on them and then having to sew them up giving them a bit of like you know hearts and minds and that so you were going straight in did you, did you ever question it like fuck me like i'm just a number here they're just throwing me in and saying you know what leave them no i was fucked mentally i was fucked <laughs> and, uh, mentally could you I just quit though i interviewed that no, sniper no, no. a couple of weeks ago uh craig harrison yeah unbelievable story yeah. he's on the edge he was a yeah. trained killer sniper mm. done what he had to do but he just struggles now to get by and did you ever think that okay i'm going to he was 23 years before he was discharged well i'll tell I'll, it, what had happened what had happened was um it, it i didn't go that way i was like going the other way 
getting really fucking dark. And now this story, I I, I am eternally um, ashamed of it. Um, I was having to wreck your route for the ambassador. He was going to the to see the Portuguese ambassador, and um, me and another lad, another jock lad, um, decided he Duncan would drive for us. So we're driving the route, and as we're driving the route, we're carrying weapons overtly, like as in on show and all the rest of it. And uh, we're coming into the town, and people are starving, but there was a stall, like a stall, and people are just trying to get money. And I, for some reason, I went, yeah, just stop here. And I started walking up the stalls, and there was this carving, and it looks like a guy sitting on a trunk or on a toilet with a spear. Fuck knows what it was, but I, as soon as I saw it, I was like, I want that. I need it. I've got to have it. There's something magical about that. And I still don't get it today. Had to have it. So I said the guy how much, and it was like $10. And I'm like, oh, bang, $10. Got it ended up $5. And I said, right, I'll be back, because I didn't have my wallet. I said, I'll be back here. Don't go. And this young lad said, no, no, please. He said, uh, the money will feed my family. I come with you. And I went, well, I'm not driving you back from the embassy back here. And he went, no, no, I'll walk, walk. It's about 15 miles. So anyway, he dives in the back of the car, dunks driving, I'm sat here, he's over there. And we're going up, the, at the time, the, the river's the River Congo, and it was when Mobutu took over, it was called the River Zaire. It's the fastest flowing river in Africa. And there's a bank side running down to it. You've got, um, you've got crocodiles and all sorts in there. And uh, as I'm driving out, I'm like, I'm looking at this guy and I'm like, Fuck this. That said to Duncan, and I'm unclipping my pistol. I said, I'm just going to fucking shoot this fuck. I'm not going to give him the money. And then I had the pistol ready to turn around and shoot him. And Duncan said, if you shoot him, you're going to have to clean the mess up. Because he said, I know, I'm not cleaning that stuff up. Well, at the time, I was that mad. I was seeing people with bullet holes in their heads and their arms, like visions. And I thought it was a gift from God. And he was showing me how people were going to die so as i looked around at him again i could see his brains up the side of the car and i looked and went nah fuck that i said uh, i'm gonna clean that shite up and i thought that was normal so anyway pulled into the embassy got the five dollars walked out this the black lad standing there and I went over to him give him the five dollars and he just fucking ran like mad the poor kid obviously knew english he knew he knew exactly what i'd been saying and I thought that was normal. It was fucking crazy. And I was off the charts. Another thing that happened was um, I'd, I'd ha I ended up getting some broken ribs. And the lads had um, g gone out on the piss. And I was upstairs. And this is in the compound of the embassy. And I could hear, like, uh, women's voices. I'm like, that fucking hell, don't tell me you've brought birds back. Well, I had two girls in there. They're trying to get them to do the act on the floor. And I went, like, fuck this. I'm like, I lost the plot because it, it wasn't professional. And this is a secure unit. I went, get these fuckers out. And the guys are all, like, fucked, fucked up. And I said, right. And these girls then started saying, we want $1,000 each. And the embassy staff are over there. So I'm trying to cry and everything down. I went, just wait, to wait, I'll get the money. Well, I had the I had the wedge, so I went upstairs, got a couple of hundred thousand dollars each, handed the two girls, I said, right, get in the car, we're off. And then they totted into the car really quietly, got outside of the embassy, there was a lad uh, driving, I went, just stop the car. So he stopped the car, my, my nine, nine milli out, straight into the mouth of the other one, I went, give us me thousand dollars. She gave us the thousand dollars back, stuck it in the other one, got the thousand dollars back, get out the car, you're walking. Not a shit. This guy's going, oh, that's not very nice, like, uh, Geordie, that's not a nice thing to do. I put the pistol to him and I said, if you fucking mention that I've got the money, I'll fucking do you, which is out of character. So gets back in next morning, said the guys, right, get round, said we're $2,000 short from them. Who is that you had in here? So it's all going to cost you 400 each. And all the lads just coughed up, put it in my pocket, and I went, right, fucking cheers. And that's not me. Just losing your shit, taking money, willing to kill people. Yeah, and it just, that wasn't me, though. And then when I think back, I'm like, what the hell was I on? And and that is, you know, that's just damage from that one week of being on the run. And I always think of 
what about these kids or these guys who have done like, you know, long, long tours under fire in Afghanistan being attacked every day? Yeah. What are they doing now? What's it all about then, brother? I don't know. But I mean, having said that, I did have an exceedingly good time. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I understand it. And I says this to Craig's podcast that um, the world would be a great place if there was no conflict or there was no greed or whatever it is. But there is. Somebody needs to do it. Like, but everybody who I speak to, there's the same patterns of that kind of... Mm -hmm. When you start on you look you look brand new, you like you look sane. Other people I speak to, you can tell they're borderline, you can tell they're fucking good people. And if I was to get into battle, these are the guys I want mm. standing with me. Like yeah. you look. I mind you, I, I was very fortunate. When I left the regiment, I set up um two big bodyguard teams. So I was actually walk uh, working um with ex SAS guys, but in a civilian job. So my trajectory into becoming a civilian was tapered because we still had the black humor, although we're dressed like this or in suits, we still had the black humor and then come in and then I started writing. So it wasn't as if I didn't have a job. I was being well paid as a bodyguard, traveling all over the world, same crack as it was when I was in the regiment. And then that tapered off and then I went to the books. So what I wasn't like, it wasn't a big jolt for me to back to earth. So I, I was very, very fortunate. Um, there was no worries. You know, I didn't have any worries. Um, and then I moved into there, that. And that come they, that brings its own its own problems, the, the, the writing. Why? In terms of like stories and things that come out. And it, it makes you think of things. Um, I never find it like a cathartic... Um, process it's if i'm talking about a firefight it's like i know what them what it's like them rounds coming over your your head and it ain't funny um so putting that down on paper and bring it out but also it's alien now i'm not a big one for like celebrityism or like hitting the red carpet or anything like that i'd rather just be like a gray a gray man um but at book signings when i'm sat there my head's down I'm writing a name, I can't see who's the left and right of me, and that's alien to me. I like to be the guy standing in the corner who's got the nine milli that you don't even look at. And it's it, it's quite different. Being on a stage doing a talk, it's all right because you can control, say, the audience, but the book signings, never being comfortable with them, you know, from the start. Are you still always on guard? Are you still always wary of just well, my noise? My, well, yeah, yeah, I am. Uh, my daughter was targeted. She had two policemen on her doorstep. For two years, why there was a there was a, a team of guys that were going to come along, you know, on video, and probably uh, take a head off, and that was that was that was um, Scotland Yard anti terror branch that that cracked it, got it in. I was in America in my house in America, and I got a phone call, and I thought they were going to tell me that there's a nutter, you know, following me, and it wasn't. It said, yeah, your daughter's being green lit. How do you feel when you Fuck get that me. phone call? It's the most frightening thing I've ever experienced because my ass went through the floor when I was on the phone to that guy. And he, he, he said, you know what they're going to do? You know who they are? He said, I can't tell you anything. He said, but it's, it's on. And he said, we've got policemen going to our house now. And then I'm on the house phone, phoning her on my mobile phone, She's looking, it's dad. She's just going to speak to that fucker later. And I'm trying to get through, so I left some choice uh, voicemails with her. And uh, yeah, so she ended up in that position. So you can't, you've just got to... And the thing is, you're always going to get nutcases everywhere. But when, you know, you get the wrong type of nutcase, because, I mean, I've had my stalkers and stuff like that, which, you know, touch wood, they, you know, they didn't do much, but... You've just got to be aware because you can never underestimate how, how many nutcases there are, are out there, you know. And it's when they come after your family or want to do something to your family, that's what fucking got my yeah. bold head, you know. Yeah. Bold so when you started the writing, once you came out, was that, is that, do you think that's what's kept you sane? It, probably. It's, it's, a, it's a driving force, you know, and it's something to look forward to because it's usually, a, the process is a good six months for an adult novel. and But then, like I was saying, when I do my kids' books, I got access to schools. And I can't, you know, 
I could I couldn't say to you like go out and buy Manhunter and read the fucker because you'll be like that you know whatever. But if I'm writing children's novels and it's there an hour there in their class and they have to read it, then I've got a captured audience. And all you've got to do is capture a kid early and get him to read. And once he gets over that sense of it's only a book and I can I can read a book, they will read when they're adults. And and it's the educational benefits of just reading that you don't know you're getting, you know, just the structure of a sentence, words that you wouldn't probably know how to spell, but you've seen it, you've read it, and, and then you've been entertained. We could all read Manhunter here now. We would see different colours. Diff- when I describe a guy, you would see somebody different. On a scene, you'd see some different. That's what makes reading books way better than being belt-fed a movie, because that's somebody else's vision. But when you read something, it's it, you, your brain setting up the information that you're reading on that page and what you see is slightly different to what other people Your own think. vision. Obviously, Chris Ryan, your name and all your books. Mm. Is that one of the reasons why you changed your name? Well, no, because when I, when I came out, um, what happened was there was a movie made uh, called The One That Got Away and that was of the my book. But they made it very controversial. And I, I only wanted a set a couple of things straight uh, with that book. I wasn't interested in doing novels or anything like that. And so I just said, right, I want a pen name because uh, obviously I'm not, I'm not fussed about the Colin Armstrong thing, but it's um, basically it was the fact was I was doing one book. Then the one that got away was number one for 16 weeks and I had a huge readership. My editor then said, would you be interested in going into fiction? And I was like, not really. I just wanted that one story. Um, but then after a few, there was a few things that had happened. Um, I then said, you know what? Yeah, I will do fiction. Well, it started off as what they called faction. So they were based on on real events that happened in the regiment, but I'd bring fictional characters in so I could tell that story. And then it went from strength to strength. And then the kids, a lot of kids were coming to bookshops saying, my dad won't let me read your adult book, be, rightly so because of the language and things. So then started doing um, junior fiction. Then I discovered this new world of something and a world where I could make a difference and a good difference. From all the shit I'd been doing in the SAS, I could make a difference in a good way. And that, that means a lot to me. And you're putting something back into society. I get letters now from kids who are now adults because I've been doing kids' books for maybe 20 odd years. And they'll say, no, I'm reading this book now. I'm reading that. This was the first book I've ever read, you know. Douche, and that means a hell of a lot to me. Yeah. See, talking about your story now, how much does it play a effect on you? Does it just normal now? Or um, well, I can, I can keep it. It can bring emotions, but I try to keep them. Uh, you know, keep on top of it. I did a program for National Geographic uh, about five years ago, and it, I was debriefed um, by a team, and it was in uh, my, in France at my place in France, and I swore I would never do it again because it was eight hours talking about, you know, each day, individual day. So when I was getting back, it started opening up other things and I'd be lying in bed thinking, oh, I've never thought of that. Uh, I must remember them, remember to tell them that. So it was just exhausting, everything. And it was nearly like a, a minute by minute account. And I felt shite at the end of it. And I said, never again, because it's, you know, there's bad memories. I've lost good friends and, you know, I can't remember anything nice on that walk. Yeah, it's always nasty and, you know, how I felt. Yeah, that's pain and suffering. Yeah, yeah. What was the thing you'd done with Donald McIntyre? Oh, that was that was hilarious. In the jungle, where yeah, he's... it was Fred uh, and, and Joe Pasquale. What happened He's was, a funny bastard, Yeah, yeah he's man. funny. He's a good friend of mine. He yeah. was actually on the phone. He, he, I better not say, he had an ailment um and he's been lucky they've getting on top of it but no what it was um freddie flintoff had gone to africa with two girls and they were doing a alone in the wild now i knew the producer who produced it so freddie was off by himself but the two girls wanted to be together so to balance it out dick phoned us up and he said uh, we're going to a uh, french guy on it. um he said uh, we've got joke pasquale donald mcintyre but to balance it off would you go with Donald McIntyre? I was like, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm not bothered. A week in the jungle, no food, no computer, that's great. Heaven for you. Yeah, yeah, totally <laughs> heaven. So anyway, we got in there, went in, 
and uh, set up the camp, showed them how to do it, but they were having the worst rain that ever had, so it was flooding everywhere. And then oh God, I was like, this is getting hard work with Donald, like, because uh, he had to have a radio on to listen and stuff like that. So I said, right, it's time I should go and I'll set my camp up. He'll be there. He was by himself for 24 hours and he had a breakdown and they nearly took him out of the jungle because they said, we're really worried about him. They had a psychiatrist watching him and uh, they got on the phone to me. I'd set up my old basher, had a massive fire going. I'm like, that, <laughs> great, the river's <laughs> there. And they went, will you go back to Donald? I went, no, I'm not going. I've got a fire going. I'm like, not doing it. But yeah, he was in, he was in shit state. But yeah, that was funny. And Joe, Joe Pasquale, when he went in, I was watching him um, because we would have uh, cameras, we would video ourselves, and then that would be picked up by local trackers and then go in. So I'm like watching like Do, uh, Joe, uh, Joe Pasquale go in and he's chatting away. He puts his rucksack down, but he just starts walking, videoing himself. And I said to the producer, I went, fucking hell, he's never going to find his rucksack again. So he's walking and where this is after the fact because we're watching the footage and he gets there and he's like, oh God, where's my rucksack? Like this. And then he's walking all around it. So we had to send trackers in to get his rucksack to him. But then Joe would just come. He said, I'm really hungry. One day he said, I'm, I'm really hungry. He said, I'm, I'm thinking of a birthday party I went to. It, uh, she was a nanorec. No, she was a bulimic. And he said, fuck me. The cake jumped out of her. <laughs> I'm just like... Where do you get them like? <laughs> but no, he's he's a lovely, yeah. lovely lad. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, with that sort of stuff, that's second nature to me. But again, they did not, uh, Donald did not like being in the jungle. Yeah. Just before we finish up, brother, one last story. What was the story with the embassy in London when they, get, um, they took hostages? Oh, well, when the, the regiment was called in, uh, it was the Iranian embassy and um, there was a policeman, journalists and other members of the staff. So it went on for, you know, quite a while. And then the... the they knew there was going to be a military intervention. So it was my old squadron, B squadron, were sent down. And it was the the, the first of its kind. Well, when, when it all went bang, the guys went in, killed all the terrorists, bar one. Um, and all the, all the hostages were saved. Uh, the funniest thing that happened there was um, you put a cordon in. Whenever you do an operation like that, after, as soon as the, the rounds have stopped firing... Um, the house, uh, the building was on fire, by the way, as well. They said, right, we need about half an hour um, before you start sending body bags in. And what, what it was, the body bags was for all the kit that these lads were pil pilfering, like paintings off the wall, these like Arabic uh, jugs and other stuff. And like uh, these big Chinese um, like vases, which were all expensive. But no, that was iconic. And all of them guys were in the in the squadron when I joined. And it was the first of their kind because what, what you call it is a, a multi-floor um, entry where they're going in from different floors and then usually meeting up on, on the stairwell. So they go in, clear a room, kill the terrorist, get the hostages secured. They then keep the hostages in one safe space. And then when you evacuate the building, their hostages are passed down uh, by other guys who are in there. But yeah, it was um, it was classic, and that was a message to the rest of the world about if you come here, this is what you'll get. And the SES were the leaders of of, of that type, and it's um, you know close quarter battle you know, with the from the anti terrorist team. Tough bastards, aren't they? Though? But I mean, they what were. Do you, going... What do you think of the the courses now? Do you know about the courses now? Can, oh yeah, yeah, the a lot. 90s? Yes, a lot more high tech. Because again, they've got GPSs. You know that'll tell you you're 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 on the spot, like an inch off the spot. You've got satellites. You've got now these nano drones. Guys have got like cameras, and they can just send it out the window around this building and say, yeah, it's secure. When the big thing for us, when in my day in the desert, to la find a place to lie up, you you just couldn't. Now the lads would get a a, a Reaper drone. At, you know. 11,000, 12,000 feet, switch on thermal, and then it would pick the, say, eight guys up, and then that would be on post for eight hours. And they're talking to it and said, fellas, sleep well. You don't even have to stag on. And there, you've got a, you've got eyes on you, and basically you've got your headset, so if anybody's coming out of the darkness, you, they'll just say, you've got guys coming in at 200. If it's a big bunch of guys, they'll say, we'll send some down for them, you know, and you're taken out. So the technology they have 
is phenomenal. But it's it's the the jobs that they're doing keep moving away and changing, and the, obviously the threat levels of different places. I mean, we saw that guy in Kenya. He's a good friend of mine. He went into that shopping center and he cleared the fucking old place out. Like you know, um, he he killed he killed four straight away terrorists, and then he orchestrated and led the charge on a seventeen hour siege, and uh, and did that. So. Yeah, the guys, when it comes down to the basics, they can still do them, but now they've got the technical stuff uh, going on as well, which makes them even better. Makes that a bit easier? It, yes, it can make it easier, but the thing to they have to remember is, in war, everything can get shut down, and if it goes bad, you still need them basic skills of knowing how to hide, how to live off the land, all the basic stuff, because you, the Americans went down the route of, Fuck it, we're flying in on a helicopter. There'll be a there'll be a black hawk on the top of this building. We'll have too many birds coming down the street. They'll drop you off at the door. You run in the door, you do the killing, you're out onto the helicopter. But if what happens if that helicopter crashes or that helicopter has to pull off and you're on on your foot, you 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 maybe lose your tracker and now you've got to survive like I did. So they still need them them basic skills. Yeah. One last question, brother. Do you miss that? Of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking nuts, that, isn't it? Like, the madness that yeah. like, yeah. was. and Because, yeah. it it's, it's, I mean, I'm 60 and my head still says I'm 30. You look great, though. But, um, but it's like, physically, you couldn't do it. But yeah, you miss it because it's the excitement and it's a bit of that adrenaline, you know, from that side. Yeah. Brother, I'm oh, coming on today and telling you. your story. You're a great storyteller. Cheers. Um, where can people buy all your books just one more time? Yeah, Amazon or any independent. Uh -huh. And if, if they give Manhunter a read, it's got the best um, f like final attack in there, best best shootout ever. Uh -huh. Thank you for coming on. I look forward to it. No doubt I'll get you on for a part two because I could have spoke there for forever. But thank you for coming on and I wish you all the best for the future. Thanks very much. God bless me. Cheers. Cheers.